Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, violations and how to handle them today. Uh, a lot of times uh, in my position, I go to different communities and we do community assistance contact visits. We do community assistance visits to see how things are going. So with that being said, um, the cartoon here on the screen is how some of you all feel when you get that phone call from myself or you get the phone call from Joseph or you get an email from Tammy um, or even when Trish, uh, Patricia Smithline, who's our new FEMA rep, when you get that phone call or email that says, hey, we're coming to your county, we're coming to your city and we want to talk about floodplain management and we want to do a community assistance visit, um, some of you probably feel this emotion on the screen here that your hair that has been torn out and more of the same that'll be coming. So we're going to talk about some of the things that we have encountered uh, as we do community assistance visits, some of the type of violations that we see over and over and over again, and kind of give you guys some tools and strategies today um, on how to deal with them so that the next time that we do come uh, and do a community assistance visit, that you are equipped, you have the tools, you have the knowledge, uh, you have the preparation to make sure that some of these issues that we're going to address today um, are handled maybe a little bit better locally, or maybe it'll give you pause today uh, after the webinar to go back and kind of look at your administration and enforcement, uh, your administrative procedures and how you do floodplain management uh, and kind of enhance that, strengthen it uh, as you move forward. So as I talked about a moment ago, a community assistance visit can be conducted by FEMA, the state, or both uh, entities. So typically uh, we have what's called a community assistance program state supporting services element. It's a grant uh, funded program that uh, funds my position. And then there are certain contractual uh, obligations that I have to do every year. And so one of the biggest uh, requirements that I have on my plate is to do a community assistance visit. And so really it's just a time where I come to either a town, a city, a county, and provide technical assistance to the community, and then try to make sure that they're enforcing their floodplain management regulations correctly. So really it's sitting down and having a conversation. Uh, when I first started this job and I would call certain communities to do a visit, um, some people would get really upset, people get really anxious. Um, when I come and sit down in a room, <laughs> sometimes I see people just freeze and um, get really anxious. And as, as I tell people, it's a conversation. We're just going to sit down and talk about floodplain management. We're going to talk about what works, what doesn't work, and what needs help. So it's really just a conversation to talk about floodplain management. Uh, we do tour the floodplain. We drive around and see um, where certain permits have been issued, uh, where historic areas of the floodplain are at, if there's been additional development. Uh, and the biggest thing when we sit down and come to visit y'all is to look at your community's permit files. So as we talked about many times in different webinars, having an administrative procedure is really important. Being organized is really important. Because when we give you the letter prior to um, having a community assistance visit, we kind of log out everything that we want to see, right? We want to see your ordinance. When was it adopted? Uh, we want to see uh, your permit files. We want to see your finished construction elevation certificates. Uh, if you've had any kind of stream realignments where um, there's been an engineering analysis, we want to see that too. We ask to see your uh, community's flood insurance rate maps. We also ask you about your uh, letter of map changes. Do you know where they are? Do you know where you have them? Um, because if some of you guys were to leave a position or go on vacation, can someone else in your staff be able to access your floodplain management files? Some of you can say yes, some of you can say no. And so that's an area where um, if it's not just you and you have staff under you, are they well versed in floodplain management? Uh, Tammy and I, before COVID hit, we went to Metro Nashville and what was really wonderful, and I don't know if Tom Palco is on the call today, but Tom Palco had all of his staff sitting in a conference room with us as we kind of went over some of the issues, um, some of the things they were doing really well and some of the things that needed improvement. And he sat there and talked about the importance of floodplain management 
on having a good administration and enforcement techniques and making sure that their ordinance aligned with their building codes and other stormwater management standards, making sure that everything was in sync and everything was uniform and everything was complementary to one another. So that was one of the best um, meetings that we've ever had, just um, having the staff have some education and some outreach with the state, with FEMA. Um, and I felt like that was just a really good example. And then we also review uh, FEMA finished construction elevation certificates. And then if there's any kind of floodway encroachment engineering analysis, we also ask for that at that time. Now, when, it, when we talk about floodway encroachment engineering analysis, we do want to have the electronic files if they're available. Uh, sometimes when we go to meetings, we just get a PDF of the uh, report, but we do just to be able to check for um, completeness and accuracy, we do like to have um, the engineering files um, if possible. And if it isn't, we will ask you guys to reach out to the engineer to get them. So when we sit down and we talk about um, a community assistance visit. Um, very few communities ever have a community assistance visit without any kind of problems, right? So everybody tries really hard. Some people maybe not so hard, but um, sometimes we can identify uh, administrative problems or a potential violation. So um, even though FEMA has a database where you can um, access what communities need community assistance visits, there's also times where um, the citizens will call with concerns about a certain community, um, the lack of enforcement or floodplain management. So sometimes citizens will call and say, hey, Amy, you need to go do a community assistance visit in Worcester or a surveyor um, we had a certified floodplain surveyor class, um, and sometimes the surveyors will sit in the class and talk about um, certain communities that they have um, maybe some communication issues or there's some administrative problems when they work with some of the floodplain administrators across the state. Um, they have given information of some communities that needed a visit. Um, engineers do the same. Um, so when we do our jobs, we don't just do it in a bubble right? Because everybody talks about everybody else. If you do it really well, people know it. If you don't do it really well, people know it. So having a good process is really important, kind of like your reputation or um, your name or the integrity that you have for your job. Because we all participate in this program. Um, but when we think about dedication, we think about preparation as a floodplain administrator, some of us do it really well, some of us don't. So um, when we do go in and do a visit, um, the community um, gets a notification after the community assistance visit, and they're given the opportunity to correct those administrative procedures and errors. So typically when I go or if Tammy goes or both of us go, the community receives a letter after the visit kind of documenting um, some of the administrative problems, uh, some of the potential violations that we see. And then typically, uh, we have what's called a three strike three out rule. So every community will get three letters. So you get the first one. If you don't address it, you'll get the second one. Uh, and if you continue to not address it, um, you will get the third letter with um, 30 days to try and correct some of those violations. So it's similar to when a community is having a remapping study that you have six months to address those issues. The same can be said for a community assistance visit. If there are uh, administrative problems, um, if there are potential violations, working on it sooner rather than later um, is good. Uh, if we send letters to communities and they don't respond, and uh, I have one right now that when I call, um, he doesn't respond to my calls. So that kind of is a little bit alarming to me. So you don't want to be in that alarming stage because, um, again, teamwork makes a dream work. And if you don't talk to us and if you don't, um, figure out how you're going to remedy some of these violations. Um, it can make things go from zero to 10 really fast. And we don't want to have that. We want to work with every community to get them into compliance. So again, make sure that when you get those letters that you address those issues sooner rather than later. And if you get those letters and you're not quite sure what all of it means, or if you feel overwhelmed, you can always call and go, hey, Amy, 
um, can we just talk about this letter or hey Tammy, what's going on or hey Trish? And we're more than happy to sit down and kind of talk with you guys about some of those issues. So this is this <laughs> a picture of um, a crawl space where someone in East Tennessee decided to um, maybe shield it. And so the surveyor that was working on the elevation certificate for the structure asked me if it was compliant. So can anybody put in the chat box what the answer would be? Did everybody put no? Okay, right. Because again, the water would have to go up and over um, the brick wall and um, if it was coming out of that um, foundation opening, it has to go up and over the wall. So that's not automatic entry and exiting. One of the first things that we see is the type of violation is a development permit. So every single community should have a floodplain development permit. Uh, if you have a development permit or a building permit, there should be information on there about floodplain. So is it in a floodplain, yes or no? What flood zone is it? What's the date of the effective map? What zone is the development occurring? Um, and these should be furnished by the community prior to any development activities. So as I always talk about to um, folks, is, and Young has heard me say this a million times, is it is always better to ask for permission instead of forgiveness. Um, right now we're dealing with an issue where some folks um, did a development and they went ahead and did it first without um, getting the proper permits from the community. And then they submitted a letter of map change to FEMA and it was considered a potential violation. So the first thing um, that you should do after this call is to look to see if you have a development permit. If you don't have a floodplain development permit form, email me, email Joseph and say, hey, can you send the statewide template now, some of you may already have a building permit and you would pull your hair out if you had to reorganize it or reformat it. It's okay to have a separate permit for floodplain development, but you want to make sure that in your file, that this is one of the first things that you have in there. So you should have Amy Miller, let's say um, 123 Main Street, Worcester, Tennessee, right? And have um, what I'm proposing to do and the different types of development on that. Um, we do have a statewide model that you can use. It's in a Word document, so you can go in there and change the header and put your community's logo if you want to. Some people get fancy with that, some people don't. Again, it's up to your prerogative, but you want to make sure that prior to any development activities, you have a permit. So again, not having a permit or omission of it constitute a violation. So sometimes we go to local communities and do a community assistance visit, and they say, well, the state's issuing a permit for development. That automatically triggers a violation because even though the state may issue a building permit, they're not looking at floodplain management. And then when I sit there and I tell the floodplain administrator, you've got to be issuing permits and looking at development, um, they kind of look at me with deer in the headlights. So again, it's in the ordinance. Um, you can see the text here above. I'm not going to necessarily read all that to you. But again, when you're doing a development permit, you have to have it issued prior, again, underline, prior to any development activities. So sometimes we go to communities, this is the first violation that we see. So um, as we talked about before, it has to be before the development commences. So um, you wanna make sure in your files that that's the first piece of paper that you see. Um, one time I was doing a community assistance visit with a community and um, the administrative assistant was supposed to go through all the files and get them organized. And she um, supposedly spent a week before I came. And when I came and went through the files, um, it wasn't organized. So you wanna make sure that before we do a community assistance visit, that every, all the I's are dotted, T's are crossed, so that the permit is in the front of the file. Let's say if you have a permit, a permit behind there for a site plan, and then a finished construction elevation certificate and other paperwork that you may need. But you wanna make sure that that's in there um, and that if I'm building a structure that this marked a structure, a lot of times when we look at development permits, 
after a calf, um, they're incomplete. Or um, a lot of times you guys will give it to a citizen to complete. And if I'm a citizen and I don't know anything about floodplain management, maybe I fill it out correctly, maybe I don't. But that's where you've got to sit down with the applicant and do the over-the-counter consultation to say, hey, Amy, what are you proposing to do? Are you proposing to do a house? Are you proposing to do an addition? Are you proposing to have um, grading and filling and paving for a parking lot for your business? What are you proposing to do? So I know some of you guys maybe um, don't necessarily have comfortability or confidence um, in doing floodplain management, but that's where we've got to work on um, just slowing down a little bit. And when you talk to the applicant to make sure that everything is part of the permit file. So it's clear that whether I look at it this year, or I look at it five years from now, that anyone looking at it um, understands what exact what type of development was going on at a certain address or a certain parcel. So once we have the permit completed, the next thing that we're supposed to have is a site plan. Um, so again, a site plan is supposed to be done by a licensed Tennessee surveyor. It's supposed to be drawn to scale, showing the nature, location, dimensions, and elevations of the area. So as well as talking about what someone's proposing to do in a lot, there should also be information on there about existing or proposed structures, uh, earth and fill placement, and storage of machinery, equipment, and drainage facility. Um, the Tennessee Association of Professional Surveyors has some new um, code of conduct um, that when someone's doing a site plan that they're supposed to be using GPS and having information on the site plan. As we've talked about other times, um, when we're working with surveyors and you're working with applicants, make sure that they download the national flood hazard layer onto the site plan, because that's a GIS layer that FEMA has on the Map Service Center website. And when they download that, you can have assurance that the floodplain is delineated correctly, the floodway is delineated correctly, and then if they go in there and they use AutoCAD and they draw where the structure is going to be, the driveway, um, it makes it much easier. Because sometimes when they do um, a site plan, I had a surveyor over in East Tennessee that was doing a letter of map revision based upon fill, and he sent it to a floodplain administrator. And the floodplain administrator was an EM, EMA director, and he didn't know how to look at it. So when I got the site plan, I couldn't tell where the fill was located either. So what you want to do is make sure that that surveyor delineates where the fill is going to be, that you have um, information on there. As far as a vertical datum, it should be the same as your flood insurance rate maps. You're comparing apples to apples. So you want to make sure that those site plans are done correctly. If there's not information on them or you feel like something is missing, there's nothing wrong with asking the surveyor to go back and revise it. So. If you just kind of want to take this text as highlighted and make sure that you kind of check off some of the certain elements, or if you have other um, entities that are working with you for floodplain management, there's different um, uh, offices that look at things. You want to make sure um, that all of them are being addressed. Because like I've told the story many times, when I worked um, back home at the county planning department, we would have TRC every Friday morning at 7 a.m. We'd have technical review committee and all the different offices would look at a development permit and make sure um, that all the elements as far as subdivision regulations, building codes, um, when they look at roads to make sure that site distance was appropriate, that the septic fields were going to work, that the soils were suitable for that. So you want to make sure for floodplain management that if you have other departments that are looking at development, that all the different uh, elements are being addressed. So for floodproofing certificates, this is something that maybe in smaller communities doesn't necessarily um, come up as much. But if you have a non-residential building that's going to be floodproof, uh, it has to be done by a licensed Tennessee engineer. And so there has to be a permit noting that the structure is in the special flood hazard area and it's being floodproof. So the engineer should be talking and should be having within the designs how the building is going to be constructed to be water tight. And if it's below the base flood elevation, how the structural components are going to resist hydrostatic and hydrodynamic loads and the effects of buoyance. 
a lot of times when we look at uh, flood proofing certificates, um, the engineer has not addressed any of these issues. So again, um, before a flood proof building is designed, um, there should be numerous planning considerations and thinking about flood warning time, what the uses of the building are, and thinking about the mode of entry and, and exit of the building and how you're going to address flood velocities, depths, um, debris impact. Because uh, sometimes there's, uh, with non-residential buildings, sometimes people can stack machinery and equipment outside the building. And if you're flood proofing the building, what are you doing about some of the stuff that's stored outside the building? Because it can be um, flying torpedoes. And then making sure um, the building um, is dry flood proof, um, if it could be um, a viable option. And so there is a FEMA technical bulletin number three that has additional um, things that can be considered. So when you do get a flood proofing certificate, you want to look to see what kind of um, flood proofing materials are being used, um, how that hydrostatic, hydrodynamic is, uh, forces are being addressed, buoyancy. Um, and then there's also supposed to be a maintenance plan um, with a flood proofing certificate. Because as we've talked about many times, if you have some sort of mechanism to keep the floodwaters out of the building, if you never ever practice using that, the worst time in the world is to try to figure it out during a flood event because there's probably going to be a lot of cussing and fussing and maybe <laughs> the gate doesn't work correctly. So in the flood proofing certificate, there should be a maintenance plan designating who's going to be in charge of doing maintenance on it and maybe even having uh, a, a maintenance uh, exercise once a year to make sure that that mechanism is being used correctly. So um, again, Sometimes uh, it does trigger a violation if some of these elements aren't being addressed by an engineer. Um, so again, you wanna make sure that when you're getting this um, certificate that there's additional documentation with it that addresses some of these elements because it talks about under the purpose of the flood proofing certificate, there's additional considerations that should be done. So you wanna make sure um, that before you accept it, uh, that you have those addressed. And if you don't, then you ask the engineer to submit additional documentation. Water course alteration. When you think about water course alteration, sometimes uh, we have stream stabilization projects, we have stream realignments, um, and the National Flood Insurance uh, Program requires uh, that there be a permit application for this, um, and that the local floodplain administrator actually um, notifies different agencies. So one thing that's supposed to happen is when you have a stream alteration or relocation project is you're supposed to notify adjacent communities and you're supposed to notify myself and FEMA. So sometimes when we do a community assistance visit, uh, I did one two years ago uh, for a community that has one that's being done um, and the engineer is refusing to submit it to FEMA um, because they're supposed to. So if there's any kind of development that's going to alter a water course of a stream, whether it's in zone A without a floodway or zone A with a floodway um, or unmapped streams, uh, you want to make sure that um, everyone is notified of this immediately. Um, again, that's where we can kind of work with the engineer to make sure that the, the submittal is compliant and then um, try to work with them to have it submitted to FEMA within six months. Um, because the engineering analysis should be sent to FEMA in a timely manner. Um, it should be sent to them within six months uh, to ensure the accuracy of the community's flood insurance rate maps through a letter of map revision. So anytime that you're going in and you're realigning a stream, um, there should be an engineering analysis to make sure um, that uh, the base flood elevation, the floodway widths, or the base flood discharge doesn't rise more than a certain amount depending upon uh, the stream and the requirements within the ordinance. And so that's where you want to make sure um, that they submit that documentation to FEMA because if it's something where the floodway width, let's say, decreases or the base flood elevations decrease, if I'm a homeowner near that property, that benefits me. 
if it's changing and it's increasing slightly, let's say less than a foot, if I'm an adjacent property owner, I should be aware of that. So again, making sure that you have all your I's dotted, T's crossed um, for this to make sure that it's compliant. Because if you don't update the community's flood insurance rate maps for the flood insurance study profile, um, then what happens is if someone else is doing something along that water course, the information that they have from FEMA or um, the high hydraulic and hydrologic study, the HECRAS model that they get from FEMA is outdated and incomplete. So a lot of times we have issues with folks that are trying to do floodway development and the HECRAS model that they have, um, once they try to go in there and do an existing conditions model of what's there currently, it doesn't add up. And then um, they get a little bit frustrated and a little bit annoyed because they have to fix the model because there was other stuff that was done along um, the stream that was never submitted to FEMA. So it's not having an apple for apple, it's maybe an apple versus a pineapple. It's something completely different. Um, and that becomes costly and frustrating for other folks that are trying to be compliant. So again, um, it should be done in a timely fashion. When we do a community assistance visit and we see that that has not been turned into FEMA, that can trigger um, a potential violation that would be part of the community assistance visit um, follow-up letter that a community has to work with the applicant. So again, um, you want to make sure that you work with the engineer, you work with the project applicant on the front end to let them know um, what the standards are. Uh, substantial improvement estimate. Uh, when we think about substantial damage and substantial improvement, um, whenever someone is going to be doing this substantial improvement, the first thing that they should be uh, giving you as a floodplain administrator is a detailed cost estimate to either repair all the damage or the cost of improvement. So uh, whenever we do a community assistance visit, we always give the uh, worksheet that's in the substantial damage, substantial improvement desk reference. There's a list of cost estimates that folks should be submitting to a floodplain administrator prior to any development. So you want to make sure that you have a detailed cost estimate before you issue a permit, whether it's for damage or whether it's for an improvement, right? So they should be giving you that they should be looking at that worksheet to make sure, and then making sure that you have that itemized cost for material, labor, um, and then making sure that it's prepared by a licensed contractor. Um, because sometimes we've had folks that have come in and they'll give you a detailed cost estimate, but instead of looking at the value of the structure, we had one in um, East Tennessee where the business owner actually submitted um, an insurance policy based upon how much the structure was insured for and try to use that to say that it was under 50%. But if you actually look at the building, it was over 50%. So it was a substantial improvement. So you have to make sure that when you're getting uh, the materials from an applicant, that you sit down and do your due diligence to look at what they're submitting to you. Because sometimes um, people try to willingly um, Try to maneuver around the truth and try to maneuver around um, the standards so you have to be careful. Um, one community in East Tennessee, someone came in to do an addition on their house and they did a second story bathroom addition um, that they did not get permits for and so the community actually took that individual to court and they had to tear down the second story bathroom. So again, um, Floodplain management or um, issuing development permits can kind of be tedious for a community um, to try to keep up with what everyone's doing. And that's where you have to make sure that you go out and do site visits and make sure um, that whatever someone's giving you for a cost estimate for repairs or for improvements is what they're actually doing and it's not going beyond that. Um, because again, you are responsible to verify whether the repairs or improvements meet that threshold. So as we talked about for other training, um, if you're going to be doing substantial improvement or substantial damage, um, what valuation are you going to use for the structure? Are you going to use the property tax card? Are you going to use an appraisal? Are you going to use the sale price? Um, how are you going to deal with uh, depreciation? So the substantial damage, substantial improvement guidebook gives you um, tools and uh, 
a process that you can use for your community. If you've never ever sat down and looked at that desk reference, now would be a good time. Um, and no matter how many uh, applications you have for this, you need to figure out what's going to be your standard operating procedure, and that's what you're going to use. Because if I come in and you say, okay, Amy, we're going to use the property tax card, and my twin sister Jennifer comes in and you say, oh, we'll just use an appraisal, you're not using the same format. So you want to make sure that everything is done uniformly and that you have that documented and processed. So that when we come in and talk about it um, through a community assistance visit, we know exactly which avenue you go down for these types of pro or, or projects and then making sure that you have the documentation in the file so that we can um, determine was it 50% or greater or was it less than 50%. The other thing I'd be remiss to say is if you do have a cumulative clause, you want to make sure that you have all that documentation for um, that property to make sure if, if let's say I've done two already and I hit 40%, I'm doing another one and it's over that 50%, you want to make sure that you have that documentation as well if you have a higher standard. So uh, anyway, when you think about doing any kind of alteration, repair, reconstruction, or improvements to a building that's in compliance with the ordinance, has to meet the compliance of new construction. And that new construction definition is really um, focusing on the start of construction. If it's commenced on or after the effective date of the initial floodplain management ordinance and includes any subsequent improvements to the structure. So sometimes people say, well, I'm just going to do an addition. I've already built it. I don't want to necessarily follow the ordinance. Again, if it's any kind of new construction, if it's any kind of development of improved or unimproved real estate, um, it does trigger um, following under the communities floodplain management regulations or ordinance. Um, so again, uh, you have to take into account deciding whether the new construction criterion is being met. And so again, you want to make sure that you have that process together and making sure that you have the paperwork um, and making sure that they do follow um, new construction guidelines. Because if you're a community and let's say that you joined the NFIP in 1990, and then all of a sudden someone's doing new construction in 2021, if you've updated your free board standards, and let's say you had it one foot above the base flood elevation, and then you decided to raise it to two feet, that new construction is going to fall under those regulations that you have. Let's say you adopted them in 2018. So if, you if your regulations, if you have higher standards, and if someone has an existing home, the new addition um, has to follow those rules or if it's a repair and the structure is over 50% damage, making sure um, that the structure is being brought up into compliance. When we think about uh, having permit files, there should be a record of the elevation of the lowest floor. Now, there are some communities that when you look at the uh, FEMA elevation certificate, there is section G that talks about community information. This is optional. If you do fill it out, you should make a copy of it as you can't mark on an elevation certificate or you invalidate it. But there are sometimes on the permit uh, form, some of the community uh, officials will write out what the elevation is of the lowest floor. And you want to be careful because sometimes people will put on the permit a different elevation that's, than what's on the elevation certificate or the surveyor will have a different elevation than what's on the permit. So again, you want to take careful consideration to make sure that if you have um, the elevation of the lowest floor, that the base flood elevation was calculated correctly, and that you go out and inspect to see that the lowest floor is one foot above that. So again, surveyors are the only ones that can certify elevations in the state of Tennessee. They're the only ones that can do an elevation certificate. And so the base flood elevation has to be uh, to the nearest tenth of a foot on there. And so again, you're going to want to refer to what um, the base flood elevation is in B9, and then you're going to be looking at the elevation of the lowest floor in C2A. So it's kind of looking at those two to make sure um, it's correct and that it actually is compliant with your community's um, floodplain management standards. Oh, my favorite topic, elevation certificates. 
Uh, one thing that when we look at permit files, um, I probably could wallpaper my apartment 100 times over, um, sitting down, writing out uh, a request to have uh, a finished construction elevation certificate. There are many on this call that when you accept an elevation certificate, it could be under construction, it could be construction drawings. You guys have got to take care to make sure to look that it's a finished construction elevation certificate. Before you issue that certificate of occupancy, it has to be a finished construction elevation certificate. All the I's have got to be dotted. All the T's have got to be correct. So look, and another thing that we noticed too is that a lot of the surveyors are just giving you guys whatever. You're accepting it. There's no building photographs or if there are steps that are leading up to the house or if there's steps off the back deck, there's no... Um, elevation information for that. So you want to make sure that when you're um, getting an elevation certificate that you're looking at it for completeness and for accuracy. I cannot stress that enough because some of you guys have gotten letters from us lately that's four pages, that's 12 pages, that has listed every single elevation certificate you guys gave us to have issues. And, um, you know, some, some states actually sit down and write out all the errors, some don't. But we tried to do it as a courtesy for the surveyor to correct it. What is sort of perplexing in my mind is that some of you guys, when you resubmit it, you don't even look at it to see if anything's been corrected and then we send it back again, that a lot of the issues and deficiencies have not been corrected. So again, as I said earlier, teamwork makes a dream work. We can send and write up some of the deficiencies, but we're depending upon the local floodplain administrator that before you send back material to us to try to address deficiencies in a cab, that you actually sit down and look at the letter that we sent with all the errors. We look at the new elevation certificate you got from the surveyor. Did they address all the different issues that Amy wrote out in the letter? Some of you guys don't do that. And it's kind of frustrating and it's kind of disheartening because you are the local enforcement official. I can help you. I, I can write all this stuff out. I can have telephone calls. I can do all kinds of things. But when we're asking you to, to correct some of these deficiencies, you've got to take interest and you got to participate in the process to make sure that these things are being remedied so that we can move forward. And then it doesn't get turned over to FEMA and that you don't potentially get on probation or, or let's say it goes really far and it goes to suspension. We want to work with you guys, but you have to work with us as well to make sure that the elevation certificates are complete, are correct. So again, it should have a finished construction elevation certificate. If that's the first thing that you do when you flip open um, the elevation certificate and you look on page two, you should be making sure that that box for C1 is marked finished construction. So that's an issue that we've seen a lot of. Um, and making sure um, that you have all the information you need prior to occupancy. Um, again, that's really important. Um, and you really, the floodplain administrator cannot certify a structure and the floodplain is ready for occupancy prior to receiving a finished construction elevation certificate. Um, so if you issue a certificate of occupancy prior to the receipt and review of it, that is a violation. So that's what we see a lot of. Um, and we really implore you um, to do a better job of making sure that you look at them. If you have questions, there's nothing wrong with emailing me and saying, hey, Amy, can you look at this? It looks a little fuzzy. So um, we can do that for you. But we also expect when you ask us to look at an elevation certificate that you looked at it as well. Um, sometimes people will send an elevation certificate and they'll say, Amy, look at it. And then when I ask you what you think about it and you can't tell me anything, that's not good. So you want to make sure that you look at it. Um, we had a training. Uh, Bart and I did a training. You can always go back and listen to that um, at your convenience that's online. Um, we're going to be doing another training uh, for the Tennessee AFPM conference in October. So and there's other um, webinars that you can listen to about elevation certificates. But if you just sit down and look at it line by line, if you've never ever sat down and read the instructions of them, um, they're really good and they're really clear what's expected. 
So again, you wanna make sure that you look at completeness and accuracy and making sure that the building diagram meets uh, with what is actually on the ground is important too, making sure that you have those um, photographs. So elevation requirements in the zone A, again, uh, if someone has a structure that's in a zone A, it should be three feet above the highest adjacent grade. A lot of times, uh, we just got an elevation certificate the other day from West Tennessee, where the insurance agent um, from State Farm sent it in for the policy to be rated and it actually got kicked back because section C had elevations and section E had um, how many feet it was above and below um, the highest adjacent grade and lowest adjacent grade. So FEMA does have uh, the capability of generating a base flood elevation. Um, if the surveyor will write a letter stating that they're doing a letter of map amendment out of shown. So there's that. And then we've also uh, given everybody, um, if you have a zone A that uh, folks can contact TVA and the Army Corps of Engineers to try to get a base flood depth determined and then shoot the nearest water surface elevation to get a base flood elevation. So sometimes we will look at an elevation certificate um, and it's not clear, um, or if there's a base flood elevation on there, it's not clear how it was determined. So again, you wanna make sure that when you're doing your administrative function, that you have that letter from the Corps, you have that letter from TVA, or if they contacted FEMA, that there's documentation verifying how the base flood elevation was generated for a zone A. If there is no base flood elevation known and you have to do um, three feet above the highest adjacent grade, section E should be completed. Um, and then uh, failure to ensure the regulatory um, free board minimum is a violation or the three feet above the highest adjacent grade is also a problem. So, um, Again, when we think about uh, zone A, um, again, you have to make sure um, when the base flood elevation data and flood boy have not been determined, um, again, they have to use a federal, state, or other source. Um, it has to have um, hydraulic modeling with it. It can't just be um, something that someone did. Um, as you can see here um, in the next slide, we've been having an issue with uh, surveyors and engineers that'll say generated by me or generated by my study. They have absolutely positively no documentation um, with the elevation certificate. So again, it has to be um, data available from a federal, state, or other source. Um, and if they do try to do it themselves, that will trigger a violation and there'll be a request to have the elevation certificate redone. Um, and you cannot use simplified methods for a base flood or for a FEMA elevation certificate where, let's say you go between two contour lines, let's say it's 510 and it's 512, and you're gonna say it's 511. There is a um, zone A uh, handbook that says you can't use simplified methods for a FEMA elevation certificate. So for record keeping, floodplain management files need to be kept in perpetuity, which is also a pretty word for forever. So you wanna make sure that you maintain all your records um, in a filing cabinet. If you have them digitally, that's fine. But you wanna make sure that you have all your records pertaining to floodplain management in one centralized location. Um, I know Tammy did a community assistance visit in West Tennessee um, and the floodplain administrator admitted that after five years, he threw away the records. That's not a good, standard operating procedure. So when the community enters the National Flood Insurance Program, you wanna keep those historic flood insurance rate maps. You wanna keep the flood insurance study profile. And then some of the materials that we send out to y'all to try to help you and try to um, increase your comfortability and capability and knowledge of this program. You wanna keep all that stuff um, in a filing cabinet or if you have your computer, let's say you just have NFIP, you have a copy of your ordinance, you have a copy of your permit, you go on the um, FEMA Map Service Center website and you sign up for a subscription for the letter of map change service. So if there's any kind of letter of map changes in your community, you can sign up for that. If you guys, we sent that out, I think twice for community.
communities, when I talk to people, they still don't know what I'm talking about. Um, when we send you guys out information to floodplain management, please read them because um, it's a little redundant for us to have to send it out again and again and again. Now we know that there can be staff turnover and there's new people um, that maybe the, what they're inheriting is not necessarily at its best. But if we do um, send you different tools and different items, make sure you look at them, make sure you keep them um, in your files um, because it can come back to help you um, when you have different questions. So you wanna make sure that you keep everything in physical, digital copies. Um, and then if you can't produce those records, um, that can trigger um, a violation. Elevating utilities is also important because all um, electrical, heating, ventilation, plumbing, air conditioning, and the like have to be um, designed and located to prevent water from entering or accumulating within the components during um, conditions of flooding. So again, um, there should be, when you're looking at uh, machinery equipment on the FEMA elevation certificate, that that should be elevated one foot above the base flood elevation. So again, when you're going out and inspecting sites, if you have a building inspector, make sure that they're looking at that so that the HVAC unit is um, elevated and that information should be part of Section D of the FEMA elevation certificate. Um, if that information is not on the elevation certificate, um, we'll send and write that out for every single elevation certificate if it's missing. So again, that's just something where um, the surveyor needs to take care to put all that and give you a finished construction elevation certificate um, when everything is completed and the grading is done and the grass is starting to grow. All right, we got a couple of questions real quick, Amy. Uh -huh. um, so first, Richard had asked, uh, do we have direct contacts with TVA, FEMA, and Army Corps uh, for individual lot via fee determination? Yes. And, uh, okay, we do? Yes, because I sent the um, letter. There's actually a Word document that I've sent to you, Richard, and everybody else that has the TVA contact and the Army Corps of Engineers. So if you don't have that, email Joseph or just put in the chat box, send it to me, and we'll just get names and emails and send it afterwards. But um, everybody has a copy of that or should. It's been sent out several times through the years. And then there's a second question from Tom Berfair. Uh So to be clear, we cannot accept a flood study from an engineer that has a step that has established a base flood elevation from 1% chance storms, aka 100 year flood uh, of rainfall in zone A, a numbered zone A. Right, it has to come from a state or federal source. It can't come from an engineer. Um, sometimes when you do look at those studies that they've done, they haven't done a, a profile run. They haven't done the 10, 50, 100, 500 year. So um, it has to be from a state or federal source. Shouldn't accept that. Okay. And that's actually, um, Tom, that's actually in the ordinance. It has to be from a state or federal source. So you can always cite that if someone is fussy about it. So we can always do that. All right, good question. All right, so again, making sure that you're elevating um, utilities to make sure the Section D um, is completed. Um, and then when we think about distribution of additional permits, if someone needs a um, Army Corps of Engineers Section 404 permit, um, that has to be um, done. So just making sure that you furnish permits or make sure that um, if you have stormwater permits, um, if you have building code permits, if you have different standards that are specific to your local community to make sure that you have coordination with those other offices and entities to make sure that um, they're getting those permits is important. So now we we'll talk about zone A, we'll talk about zone A. E. Um, for the statewide model regulations, most communities have adopted that. So they have a one foot free board above the base flood elevation. Um, and as I've talked about a million times, you probably should have um, a sweatshirt with it. Uh, if the base flood elevation needs to be determined from the flood insurance study profile, um, it should be. So if you have anyone that marks firm, um, that should only be used for coastal communities. There has been discussion and fussing about why don't they just make a Tennessee specific elevation certificate but they make one uh, nationwide for coastal and non-coastal states. 
So if any uh, surveyor marks the firm that is not supposed to be used as a sole source of elevation information. Um, so if they have something on there, let's say that they just have 515 and it's not to a tenth of a foot, that'll flag a potential violation. Um, if they mark firm, uh, that's a potential. We will ask them to go back and um, use the flood insurance study profile. Uh, some surveyors uh, have talked to one another. And so sometimes they'll mark that they using the flood insurance study profile, but the proof is in the pudding. So you want to make sure that you have that documentation. You want to have that BFE worksheet where there's actually a method to the madness and determining um, how they generated the base flood elevation. So there's nothing wrong when someone gives you an elevation certificate to ask for that. And if they haven't submitted it um, and you do a community assistance visit, we will ask um, that they submit that as part of the documentation. Now, sometimes what happens, um, we did a, uh, we did a community assistance visit over in East Tennessee and one of my favorite surveyors, we had some of his elevation certificates, but we didn't have any in the flood insurance study profile. And he said, Amy, I gave it to him. And so when you, when we're asking for some of this information to review, please make sure that you give us the full um, application package because he went ahead and, and sent us the flood insurance study profile. So we were able to verify what he did but the community didn't send that to us. So sometimes that kind of slows down the process a little bit. But you want to make sure that when you're giving us documentation that we're requesting, um, that you give us everything that we need. So for zone AO, um, when you look at that, um, these are special flood hazard areas that are associated with base flood depths listed one to three feet. Um, and then the lowest floor shall be elevated at least as high as the depth specified on the flood insurance rate map, plus a free board of one foot above that highest adjacent grade, or at least three feet above the highest adjacent grade if no depth number is specified. Um, this isn't necessarily something that um, a lot of you deal with. There's some of it over in East Tennessee, but in zone AO, the free board must be a minimum of one foot above the flood depth listed on the firm, or three feet above the HAG if no uh, base flood elevation exists. So for zone AH, again, um, this is the same sort of thing that these areas are subject to inundation by the 1% annual chance of flood where the average depths are one to three feet and the base flood elevations are derived from hydraulic analysis shown in the zone. Um, so again, you wanna make sure that they meet that and in AH free board in light of requirements for zone A without the BFE established, it must be three feet above the HAG if no flood depth exists. So sometimes that can be on a case-by-case -case basis. You're just going to look at the flood insurance rate map to try to see um, how you're supposed to navigate that. Sometimes there is a base flood depth on there. Sometimes there's not. So again, in your ordinance, it has regulations of how high you have to go um, if that information is known or not known. One type of violation that we have seen a lot of, and I know, Yon, you're on the call today, uh, Floodway encroachment. So every single community floodplain administrator has regulations that he or she should read. They're fascinating. Um, they're, they tell you exactly how you should do your job as far as floodplain management. Now, some of it may have a little bit of technical uh, information in there or terms that maybe you wouldn't necessarily use in your everyday life. But as you continue to do more training and um, attend more sessions, some of it should start to click a little bit. But the one thing that we see sometimes is we see development that was done in a floodway that encroaches a floodway, and there's not um, an engineering analysis that was done. So sometimes we'll drive or tour the floodplain. Um, I was over in West Tennessee, was driving down the road and saw um, where there was a company that was doing excavating and um, kind of like a rock quarry and different things that they were doing development in the uh, floodway where there wasn't an engineering study. So, um, you know, sometimes some communities try to do um, an engineering analysis review on their own. We have the ability to review it um, here in the state office to make sure that it's complete and compliant. So you want to make sure um, 
then if you have something that's coming in that you're doing it correctly um because if you don't that can also trigger a potential violation um and in some cases um we haven't had a no rise yet in tennessee um but if there are changes in the model um, a conditional letter of map revision can be submitted to fema prior to the issuance of a development permit so the first thing is to have the engineering analysis done the second thing is to have it reviewed and if it's incomplete we will ask for additional information and once that additional information is submitted if there's rises in the model if there's changes to the floodway width if there's changes to the base flood discharge um, that information has to be submitted to fema prior to the issuance of a development permit this is where we have seen a lot of um, potential violations is that um, some of the engineers in the state don't understand um, the complexity and the magnitude of doing an engineering analysis so they'll do a little bit but they won't do all of it or they don't really do any of it and um, some of you guys when you get something from them you never read it um, I had one the other day where the front page said that it was a no rise but you actually looked at the next page and there were rises in the model so again don't blindly accept these and just go ahead and allow um, development because it can come back to haunt you. Um, we do have one community in West Tennessee that's having a class action lawsuit because of a floodway encroachment and the community not um, enforcing their floodplain management regulations. So this is serious stuff. I know a lot of times when we have these, people kind of giggle and they think it's funny, but it's really not because if you're the floodplain administrator, you can be liable um and it's just not a good place to be so again you want to make sure that development in your community is compliant so we have the next one the zone ae without floodways again you want to make sure that the engineer is doing an engineering analysis where um, the cumulative effect is not going to have the base flood um, rise more than one foot at any point within the community so it's not going to increase the water surface elevation so um again Having a complete study is important by the engineer, making sure that they get um, the HECRAS model from FEMA. If it's a HEC2, then someone has to put it into the HECRAS, sit there and type it all out, you know, if they have microfiche or film or whatever. So again, they have to follow um, the standards to do a complete engineering analysis. For zone A streams, um, you want to make sure that um, if someone is doing a development that they make sure that the structure or the fill material shall be located within an area equal to the width of the stream or 20 feet whichever is greater measured from the top of the stream bank so again you want to make sure that when you have a site plan if there is a zone a stream that um that the surveyor is using the national flood hazard layer to show that um, and that they're also making sure that they're delineating or they're showing a buffer where development is not going to be occurring within that area um, we have had some problems with that so again there should be an engineering certification and it should be supported by standard hydraulic engineering principles so um, it is in your ordinance if there's any kind of stream on the property and there's any kind of development within that buffer or within that area it's going to trigger an analysis uh, for unmapped streams um, again no encroachments including any fill or other development shall be located in an area at least twice the width of the stream measured from the top of the stream bank um, and it, again um, it has to have certification by a uh, registered professional engineer and they have to demonstrate that the cumulative effect of the proposed development will not increase water surface elevation of the base flood more than one foot at any point um, so, another, another quick question okay. from uh, tom to share he was asking uh, what I'm assuming is about violations concerning in-ground pools in a flood zone. Well, it depends because if it's going to be in-ground, if it's at grade, you want to make sure that the utilities are water or flood proof so that the mechanisms are, uh, that water isn't going to accumulate in there. And if the, the mechanism and machinery and equipment servicing the pool, if it's not in-ground and it's, outside of that then you want to make sure that that is elevated one foot above the base flood elevation so that the water can accumulate in those 
uh, elements. So again, that's where you'd want to have a site plan and talk with the homeowner to make sure that you know exactly where those utilities that are going to be servicing the pool are going to be located and if it meets your um, ordinance. Good question. Um, I get a lot of questions about pools. Um, there are information online um, from FEMA about pools, but it's mostly in coastal zones. So I wish someday they would have some for just river rain situations. Uh, another issue that becomes a potential violation is when you look at building diagrams um, seven, eight, and nine. If you have an enclosure, um, this below the base flood elevation that's used for parking, access, or storage, or if you have a crawl space for diagram eight or a subgrade crawl space for diagram nine, um, and looking at foundation openings. So again, um, if there's any kind of foundation or other exterior walls that are below the lowest floor that are subject to flooding, they have to be designed um, to allow the entry and exit of flood waters um, to automatically um, equalize hydrostatic flood forces on exterior walls, right? And so those areas should not be used as living spaces. Sometimes that can become um, a little bit tricky, especially let's say I have a Tennessee River home and I have that little tiny space under there that's 200 square feet. Let's say that I want to store my um, barbecue and uh, let's say I have kayaks and all kind of stuff. If I have all that kind of stuff in that enclosure, if all of a sudden over the course of time that 200 feet becomes the whole bottom of my structure, and I use it for living purposes, that um, triggers a violation. So when you have an enclosure or a crawl space, um, they're not part of living spaces, they should have sufficient openings. Um, that's one thing that becomes an issue is that you have to look sometimes at the base flood elevation versus um, the elevation of the crawl space or enclosure to see if it's below the base flood elevation, you are required to have foundation openings for them. And then um, sometimes people will put zero or they'll leave it blank. Um, and that's where um, homeowners can get hammered for flood insurance. So um, again, it should have a minimum of two openings that have a total uh, net area of not less than one square inch for every square foot of enclosed area. The bottom of all openings should be no higher than one foot above the finished grade, either interior or exterior. And then the openings should be equipped with screens, louvers, valves, or other um, coverings or devices that they permit the automatic flow of flood waters in both directions. So as we saw that picture initially, um, we started the presentation today, that does not constitute uh, a compliant flood opening. So you want to make sure if you have a 1500 square foot home, you have 1500 square inches of vents. Um, if they are engineered, there should be um, a certification as part of the FEMA finished construction elevation certificate. Another thing that we started to run into is that um, sometimes people will have flood openings and they'll have that ICC certification, but the certification has expired. So the surveyor needs to go back through, there's a website where you can actually look up the model number to see if that cert if the certification expired in 2020, if you're putting it in 2021, it should be renewed, but they have to go in and make sure that that certification um, is uh, still valid and still good um, and go on the website and look at that. And we can send that to y'all a little bit later in case you have questions, or if you want to send it to your surveyors, because this does become an issue. Um, so that's that's something new that we've seen this year. Um, so one thing that we say is not every foundation opening is a flood opening um, and they have to meet the criteria to be compliant. So it has to have automatic openings and it has to be, um, the bottom of it has to be not less than one foot above the natural grade. Um, there are some building code standards about having it open and we at least have a three inch opening. Um, and then if someone's using a non-engineered flood vent, making sure that, that mechanism that opens and closes has been broken to stay open um, is important. And before you issue that certificate of occupancy, you want to make sure um, that that's being done. Uh, sometimes you have a a garage that's on the bottom floor that's below the base flood elevation and 
homeowners sometimes get a little bit upset when they have to put vents in the garage. Um, please don't ask if a, a garage door is an automatic opening because it is not. Um, sometimes we have people say, well, I'll just, I'll just open the garage door in a flood event. Well, what if you're on vacation or what if you're shopping or different things? So that is not a compliant um, flood opening. Um, so again, uh, for an enclosure, you can allow parking of vehicles, access or storage. Um, and you wanna make sure that it doesn't get converted into living spaces. Um, sometimes some communities have uh, homeowners sign a non-conversion agreement. Um, and then making sure that utilities are um, not elevated. One must show that the equipment is designed to prevent the accumulation of floodwaters. So again, sometimes we go out and driving, we see some of these violations. Um, one community that uh, I went out with the floodplain administrator years ago, um, they don't have any kind of administration or enforcement techniques. But we drove the whole floodplain, we drove the whole county over five days. And so the floodplain administrator was in the car with me and he'd say, hey, Amy, stop, back up. So back up the car and he'd be writing down home numbers because the folks would go to 911 and get a property address, but no one ever told him that there was a new structure so they couldn't assess property damage. So again, um, you wanna make sure they kind of drive around and see because people will convert things that they shouldn't and just driving the floodplain every once in a while um, is important. So again, you wanna make sure that the interior portion of the enclosed area is not finished or partitioned into separate rooms. We talked about, um, again, it triggers a violation. Another one that can trigger a violation is recreational vehicles. Um, the National Flood Insurance Program under the Code of Federal Regulations has standards that a recreational uh, vehicle can be on site uh, no more than 180 days. So there should be a permit and there should be a little site plan where you sketch where the um, recreational vehicle is. Um, one of the first community assistance visits I did with uh, someone who I adore, we were um, driving around the floodplain and he said, this is where a recreational vehicle is and I always want to bust them on day 181, but they always move around a lot. So when there's major subdivisions um, that are happening, require the all new subdivision and proposals. Um, if they're 50 lots or five acres, whichever is the lesser, include within such proposals base flood elevation data. So if there is um, this, then there should be um, a hydraulic and hydrologic um, study done to determine the BFE for each lot. And because that's new technical data, that should be submitted um, to FEMA, um, this new technical data, and it would update the flood insurance rate maps so that if I was in an area nearby that, um, the, the BFE was determined and can help update new maps. Um, we talk about um, variance process. Um, if someone wants to have a variance from the floodplain regulations, um, I always say no. Um, because when you start to issue variances, it kind of opens up Pandora's box. And what you allow me to do, then someone else could want to take it even further. So it has to be done by a formalized process, and it should be submitted in writing. Now, if I'm so, if I'm a Amy Miller citizen and I want a variance, if let's say, um, let's say that I'm, I'm going to go to Tom Brashear um, and I'm going to submit that to him, then as a staff person and as a floodplain administrator, he would write a rebuttal based upon um, the floodplain management regulations. And so then we would go before the Board of Zoning Appeals. I would talk about um, why I think it's a good idea. Tom would think talk about why it's not a good idea. Um, and then if there is a granting of a variance, the community has to write a letter um, to the applicant and there will be a $50 surcharge on the policy. So Tammy sent me information last year about a community in Houston um, where there was a lady that granted a variance because she was handicapped and she didn't want to elevate her home. There was a hurricane that hit. 
she went back and sued the community because they granted her a variance based upon false grounds and she won. She won money. So you want to be careful when you grant a variance. There's very specific standards within your ordinance where it can be granted. But again, um, a lot of people try to use that word hardship and twist it and turn it to try to fit their um, situation. But an economic hardship is not a hardship. Uh, real quickly, we're going to kick it back. We had a couple of questions. So Tom Brashear just had a comment um, saying that, referring to RVs, that this is particularly important now that uh, many communities are beginning to allow accessory dwelling units as alternative to nursing home care uh, and assisted living to boomerang kids coming home. So obviously keeping up these standards with uh, RVs and including some of the different you know environmental changes where we're seeing more floods, you know, uh, making sure we're not making these violations is really important. And then Carrie Williamson had a question for Amy. Uh, so RV standards apply to people with RVs on their personal lots, not just RV campgrounds, correct? Correct. So you bring up a good, you both bring up a good point because what happens is um, a lot of times when you go um, to different places, they have an RV park or, or let's say that um, I'm just someone that I'm building a house on an agricultural lot. Um, there's a place that I go to a lot just to escape Nashville. And so sometimes I'm driving on those country roads, I'll see an RV parked on a lot and it's just there, um, but it's still road ready and it's still um, quick disconnect from utilities that it could be off the lot in five minutes. The problem becomes and the headache becomes when the recreational vehicles that are there six months, all of a sudden the tires get low and they put a porch on the back and it becomes a structure then that becomes a potential violation because it's not road ready, quick disconnect, and it's been on the lot more than 180 days. So that's where it gets a little bit more difficult trying to enforce the regulation. Um, it's just, you know, it can get hard sometimes. So when we think about responses to these violations, so um, one thing is to make sure that no land structure um, or use shall be located, extended, converted, or structurally altered without full compliance with the terms of this ordinance and other applicable regulations. A lot of times I get calls from floodplain administrators where someone has um, gone in and started a development and they haven't um, come in and gotten a permit. So if they go in there um, and do any kind of work on a structure, work on a parcel, and they haven't gotten any um, permits, that's a violation. So again, um, there are some enforcement techniques that you can do. So if there is, um, it talks about um, with, about penalties for violations. So the community can take legal action against someone and uh, work with the local court to try to do a, a misdemeanor um, because they violated the conditions. Um, another thing, is that any person who violates this ordinance or fails to comply with any of its requirements shall upon adjudication, therefore, be fined and by the Tennessee statute. So again, that's where you want to, um, and you have to pay all costs and expenses involved in the case. So that's where you want to work with your local um, attorney in a community to see um, whether or not that they would want to take this kind of action. Um, there's a lot of, um, attorneys, there's a lot of planning commissions, there's a lot of board of zoning appeals that don't really understand these regulations. So I know a lot of communities have the four hour training once a year on floodplain, or I'm sorry, uh, just for planning to, to stay with those requirements. But if you guys have never ever done training on floodplain management, this would be, you could use some of this stuff in here, you could use some of the material that's in the NFIP 101, but just do a brief overview of what as a participating community you were required to do. But some people will sit there and be astonished that they never ever knew that. So if there is kind of a potential violation, there should be issued a stop work order. And then you can also, if they still continue to do whatever is in violation, you can um, take them to court. But again, you want to talk to the mayor, you want to talk to your uh, attorney that advises the community on how that is done. There's some communities that have a really good uh, legal staff that understand floodplain management, but most 
don't understand it at all. So that's a missed opportunity. But yet after this is an opportunity for you to talk to them. Another quick question. Um, so this one's interesting. Uh, Aaron Sams asks, is there a building diagram or flood restrictions for a yurt? A canvas walled wooden structure? Uh, yeah. Wow. Hi, Aaron. Um, FEMA considers a structure to have a permanent foundation, two solid walls, and a roof. So I don't believe a yurt would fall under NFIP regulations. Now, Tammy, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard of that one, but um, just under the, what would be described as a structure would not fall under that. So to clarify, Amy, um, uh, from my understanding, um, the building just has to have walls and a roof, not and tied to a permanent foundation is a requirement. I think this is a really great question, Aaron, and I'm actually going to kind of take it back to the office and we're going to do some research on this because you brought up something that I know I've seen other places too, right next to water bodies. And so I think these are happening a lot and maybe we do need to um, clarify that um, for everybody. And I've also uh, noticed having stayed in a few years, some, some of them are electrified, but the canvas can be rolled up on the sides. So you could theoretically have flow, but the one picture that Aaron shares, it shows that it's on some sort of built deck. So yeah, this is, that's a very quirky, interesting question. So Aaron, what we'll do, we'll get an answer and then we'll put it in the um, Tennessee uh, TNA FPM newsletter. And maybe if you have a picture, you can show that. That'd be hilarious. Um, good question. All right, so we'll continue on. I kind of like these because you guys ask good questions and we know you're paying attention, which is even better. Um, so another response to violations is to issue a stop work order for the project. That is something that you all have um, as a local enforcement agency when it comes to um, floodplain management. A lot of times people think, oh, well, Amy is a floodplain cop. Amy will make them stop. Um, I have no enforcement capability whatsoever. So um, if something's going on, um, the buck stops with local community. So there's nothing wrong with asking to issue a stop work order and making the um, necessary corrections um, to the structure or to the project. Um, so again, um, any kind of construction alterations need to be, uh, for the project need to be brought into compliance by the property owner. Um, and the issue stop work order until they're fixed. So there should be a prior, priorities uh, for corrective action. So um, any kind of alteration, repair, reconstruction, or improvements to a building that is in non-compliance with the provision of its ordinance should be undertaken. Um, only if said non-conformity is not um, further extended or replaced. So no additional permits for peripheral um, alteration can be issued to the property owner until floodplain violations are corrected. Um, so as we talked about before, for just an overview that any kind of violation constitutes a misdemeanor offense can result in adjudication and fine. Um, and again, it's the inherent illegality. Local violations can result in serious consequences to the property owner um, in case of a flood event. It should be dealt with quickly. Um, and again, if you guys have problems and you have issues, who are you going to call? Amy Miller. So call me. Let me know because if you guys are struggling with an issue, if you don't call me and let me know, I can't help you. So um, sometimes we're able to diffuse certain situations if we just pick up the phone and have a call or we have a webinar to talk with folks. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And then some consequences for property owners include um, higher flood insurance policy premiums. So sometimes we have uh, potential violations where someone will not put in, let's say foundation openings in a crawl space and they can have higher flood insurance premiums. So sometimes just talking to them that if they don't correct the violation, they could be paying for it over the life of the loan. Um, and then making sure that you have stop work orders. So again, um, for state and federal overview, um, we try to work with communities to make sure 
um, that the potential violations are being dealt with. Um, and we do send letters detailing um, things that we would like to see corrected. Um, and various consequences of violations include probation. Uh, if you're a CRS community, you can be uh, have a lower um, classification. If you're a class eight, you can be bumped to a nine, or if it's serious, you can possibly um, be retrograded in the uh, program or possible suspension from the NFIP. Um, if, if we see that it, that you're in good faith trying to work on some of this stuff, that's great. Um, if you ignore it, that's not great. So you wanna make sure that you work with us to get these issues um, addressed um, because if you are suspended from the NFIP, you can be ineligible for federal money um, made available in an emergency flood disaster declaration. So do you guys have any, well, I think we'll let Tammy go next and then we'll save time for um, questions. Real quickly before Tammy hops on there, a little trader had a quick uh, question. He posted a couple minutes ago. Um, are TDOT and TDEC required to coordinate with the municipalities with what they're working on in the floodplain? Uh, TDOT has an exemption for their projects. They still do um, engineering analysis. Um, but TDEC, we're trying to work with them a little bit better on um, projects to make sure that they're looking at floodplain related issues. So um, it's, it's a work in progress. But I will say that TDOT has started to send some of their community um, project engineering letters to say it has 0, 0.00, it has a one foot rise for some of their different projects that we never had before, but they have for the last two years started to give us letters. So at least we know some of the different road projects are compliant. All righty, sweet. So we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Tim. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, so you may recall at the beginning of Amy's presentation, she talked about that there had been a community, uh, in a community that there had been some unpermitted development and that the developer applied for a LOMAR and that it ultimately resulted in a potential violation. And so we just kind of want to clarify what we're talking about right now, with these potential violations. They're really associated with non-compliance that gets identified during a letter of map change review process. And so what we want to do is kind of cover that a little bit today, um, just to give you a little bit more information about that process and how these uh, potential violations can be identified. And so, um, when um, an applicant submits a letter of map change, so we're talking about the letters of map amendment or letters of map revision based on fill or a you know full map, letter of map revision, um, you know they're reviewing it to see, uh, particularly in the case where people are trying to get removed, they're reviewing it against the current map as um, that's in effect for that community to see if it warrants a removal, you know, is the ground elevation higher than the base foot elevation? So that's one of the reviews they're doing because that's what the applicant is applying for. But in addition to that, they're also looking to ensure that these structures are compliant um, with the requirements in the CFR. And so um, they're going to be looking at the the flood insurance rate map that was in effect at the time the development occurs. And so that image you see over on the left is actually from a real case file. And so what they do is they, they've taken the imagery that we have or the surveys, whatever is provided in the um, application, and using the GIS software, they overlay the historic, if there is a historic firm for that property, uh, sorry, for the community on top of that property to try to figure out if, um, you know, sorry, what flood zone the property was in when that uh, structure was built. And if they identify what we're calling a potential violation, they do notify staff at headquarters with their findings. 
um, and ask them to take a look at that uh, and review the comments. Uh, Joseph, if, you, if you'll go uh, advance, please. <laughs> OK, and so if headquarters agrees with the findings, then that particular letter of map change case gets suspended and that um, suspension is indefinite while we have this potential violation case open. The image over on the left is actually a sample letter in it. Um, that letter is actually sent to the community CEO, the chief elected official, um, so it can be a mayor, um, a uh, county mayor. Sometimes we're actually given city administrators. That's who they want us to contact directly. Um, but it's whoever we've been given is that point of contact. The letter is sent to. A copy is sent to the applicant. And in the letter, it actually gives you information about the application as well as uh, the findings uh, for those potential violations in here. So a copy of that letter is also sent to the FEMA region office that works that state. And as you know, in Tennessee, the region four is the one that uh, is assigned to work with Tennessee. Next slide, please. And so this is just a portion of the, the lower part of that letter, just kind of zoomed in to kind of give you an idea of what's there. And if you'll notice, hopefully the yellow highlights show up a little bit. It actually gives you the citations out of the CFR 60.3 that they've identified as potential violations. Um, and so in this case, we've got a D3 and we've also got a C2. Um, so next slide, please. And so once we get um, these potential violations addressed, I just want to point out that these are based on the information that has been submitted in the application and whatever else they are able to find on the internet, whether it's aerial photography, sometimes they can find some additional structural information on uh, websites. Um, but that's what they're working from. And so once we get these cases in the region, the first thing that that I do is I take a look at what the case file has in it, what was submitted, and then I start working with the state and the community to try to get the rest of the story. Um, and so the, the applicants provide what they can find, but it may not always be the most accurate information. Um, and so an example, you're probably looking at the images going, what, why are these here, right? So we've had cases where um, structures are built in maybe the 70s or 80s. And yes, we do get those really old structures and they're applying for a letter of mat change today. Um, and so if you think about your older flood insurance rate maps and what was on them and the lack of details that there were in some cases, um, especially in the early stages of our mapping program, you know, trying to determine where, the, where that line is on their property um, can be difficult. And so really the point of this is to tell you, we understand that when those maps were created, it's more like the, um, the Hewlett Packard calculator at the top left. And we don't use the technology that's available today um, to try to um, reconfirm a determination that was made 40 years ago. Um, so we will look at the regional level, we will look at what was clearly available on the firm and take a look at it, keeping in mind what was available to the floodplain administrator at that point, not what's available today. And so in some cases, once we've reached out to the community, we're able to immediately, you know, figure out how to resolve the cases. Um, and I apologize, the first example that came to my head was for a, you know, a coastal area, so in a V zone, um, an EC would come in telling us the building was slab at grade. That's what the surveyor sees when he walks out there, right? He clearly can tell there's a slab there and it's right at grade on the property. But in fact, it's actually a pile supported slab. He doesn't know that there's that additional foundation underground because he hasn't seen the construction plans. And in those cases, we quickly identify what it is, we get the additional documentation, and we can close the case out right away. Other times, we're able to confirm based on the information that we get from the community that, yes, there actually is a violation. Um, 
<clears throat> and as we're working through, you know, that initial potential violation case, we get additional documentation from the communities and we have in times actually identified additional violations. Um, so know that that we can add to what's in that letter if we do find some additional things similar to what you see in a cab. We, you know, we see um, the initial thing um, that we identified, maybe um, insufficient flood openings, but once we get the rest of the information, we can identify some uh, additional violations. Next slide, please. And so just to reiterate, those letter of map change cases are gonna remain suspended until the region notifies headquarters um, and the LOMAC group that the potential violations have been resolved. Um, as I think I've stated and I'll restate, we do work with the state and the community and the applicants to try to resolve these cases. Um, in the letter that is sent out, um, it actually advises them to contact Jason Hunter, who's our branch chief. Um, that's just the standard position they refer all letters to, uh, but it's been delegated and I'm the one who actually works these potential violation cases for all eight states in the region. And a lot of times the applicant will get that letter back just as soon as it's you know, emailed to them, they've opened it up and they've reached out to us faster then we can open up our copy of the letter and then reach out to the state or the community. Um, so sometimes the coordination happens in reverse order of what we would normally handle it, um, but know that we will include the community into the conversation, even if it begins with um, the applicant first. Next slide, please. And so, we wanted to point out that about 60% of the cases that we get in the region, so this is 60% for all eight states, 60% of those case, these cases are for development prior to 2010. And we bring that up because permit records are so important to everything in floodplain management, but they really play a key role in trying to resolve these potential violation cases. And we just want to remind you, you know, Amy's mentioned it, that these records are permanent records. Um, since 2014, which is when I took over the potential violation uh, responsibility forum, um, we've had 28 potential violation cases identified in the state of Tennessee. Next slide, please. And here's the that 28 broken down. So of the 28, 15 of those, have been encroachment into the regulatory floodway. And so they've been cited, uh, the violations have been the D3 um, citation. Uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, Amy created uh, the additional services she's providing for the floodway reviews um, was just this number just kept, we were seeing it increase every year for a while. Um, and so she took those steps to try to um, help a, you know, address those, um, the the needs of the local community to try to, uh, you know, review the, the floodway encroachments. Um, and if you'll notice in the other cases, those other 13 that are listed there, you might kind of see some commonality. Um, you know, the first line, we've got flood openings, and you'll see two more of the lines, flood openings are also listed. And then, you know, on three of them, we've got the lowest floor elevated. So they're there does tend to be some commonality that comes in related to these particular uh, violations that are identified. Um, one of the things I want to point out is um, this is something I've learned as I've gone through these cases is flood openings were not a requirement in the CFR and it didn't go into effect for local communities until October 1st of 1986. So that's the other thing that we're looking at is, is what's been cited in the letter, was that a requirement at the time of the construction? Next slide, please. And so I wanted to just point out a few things here um, about how the lack of the permit records can impact the property owner. Um, 
so the first one being that it's difficult to resolve these potential violation cases. And, you know, I just mentioned flood openings weren't required until, you know, October 1 of 1986, but we had a particular case come through in Tennessee in the last year where the citation was they had absolutely no flood openings, so it was zero. And, but they told us the date of construction was 1987. Most of these applicants are giving us the dates they find on this on the the tax assessors or tax appraisers website. Um, those dates are not, uh, in most cases, those dates are not as accurate as we need them to be. And so, in this particular case, um, that applicant told us that the the house was built in January of 1987. And what we had to do was go back and figure out if that house potentially was permitted prior to that requirement going into effect in October of 86. So there's a lot of research and just trying to find pieces of information where we can place uh, piece it together to try to work to resolve these cases. Um, and so, it can also leave a property owner in limbo, kind of like the one I just described. So I'll give you another scenario. Um, let's say we have a house built in 1990. That's that's all we've got, 1990. But we have firms that changed on July 1st of 1990. So we now need to figure out which side which side of that date was that house permitted? Because on the 1974 firm, the house was clearly in zone X, but as of those 1990 firm, the house is now in zone AE. And so the permit information is invaluable in trying to establish these dates. I have gone so far as to have um, people looking through their house, through the circuit box, through the, um, anywhere there may be an inspection sticker that may have been placed on something within that house at some point to try to establish these dates. The other thing that can result is that property owner has an increased flood insurance premium. They may have a forced place policy because they're disputing it. Uh, they could have uh, you know, a, a, a policy that's based off an elevation certificate and they're you know, a few feet below what the current requirement is. Um, when in actuality, um, you know, they may qualify for, if we can get them removed, um, they may qualify for a lower premium. And so I'm going to just say the second example I gave you is disregard that one because that doesn't affect, uh, it was incorrectly stated. Um, but just know that it can affect the insurance premiums because we can't get these cases closed so the determination cannot be issued. Um, and in, in a few cases, we do have structures that legitimately are elevated above the base flood elevation, but because we can't get um, resolution on the potential violation, we can't close the case and the determination cannot be issued. Uh, next slide, please. And so I mentioned this um, earlier talking about the, the building permit, when was it issued? So by definition, the start of construction and it's a very lengthy um, definition, but it basically starts with the date the permit was issued. And these are just some examples of why that date is so important in making these determinations. Um, so next slide, please. <clears throat> and so here's just the, the contact information. Um, as Amy mentioned, um, I'm now working with the state of Florida, and so Trish Smithline has um, is backfilled me and is now Amy's counterpart at the region. So if you don't already have it, this is her email address. Um, and then I, as I mentioned, I do all the, these potential violations identified through the LOMAC process, and so I'm still the point of contact for all of those. But thank you very much. <laughs>